We've thought about how you can talk about optic flow with little changes in space and little changes in time. That means derivatives and so things like Sabel, um, which we can calculate across the image. So there's something called the optic flow equation, which basically combines these derivatives in the image, these gradients. And also in that equation are these two things that we want to get out, this u and this v. So these are our optic flow vector for each pixel, which way is things going. In order to do that though, we have to make some more assumptions because there's two unknowns and we have one equation. So this is where people come up with a, a load of different ideas for how to um, frame the problem so that you can get at those u and v values. So one method that um, solves for optic flow and gives you these little uh, what are called quiver plots where for each pixel here you've got this um, u and v vector so you can plot these across a whole image and if you look in the video that is on screen now you can see all these plotted and showing things moving around. One of the methods for calculating this stuff um, originated in the 80s, so I think it was 1981, um, by uh, uh, a couple of people called Horn and Shunk. So if you look up optic flow, this will be the sort of one of the first techniques that's mentioned. Um, again, sort of bear in mind that in, in the 80s it was a challenge just to get any kind of video onto a computer at all. Um, and uh, yeah, you know, you're talking about working with TV standards like PAL or NTSC rather than things like VGA, which came along uh, sort of nearer, nearer the 90s. So these are gonna be originally quite low resolution images, maybe 320 by 200 or something like that. If you're talking about 4K images here, uh, nowadays, yeah, you've got a lot more calculations to do. So the assumption that uh, Horn Shunk make um, in order to get out these U and V components of optic flow is that they look in the, the local neighborhood. So as well as just considering an individual pixel, so we haven't got enough information there to figure out what optic flow is, what they do is they say, actually, let's look at the neighboring pixels here, and we're going to basically put in a constraint into our solver that says our U and V here should be quite similar to an average U and an average V in the local neighborhood. What we're going to assume is that this motion isn't going to radically change between pixels. If we're on a surface, the motion change is going to be small, unless you're at an edge, of course, so we break another constraint there. But most of the time, you know, if this table's moving around, all the pixels are going to be moving in roughly the same direction. So we have this smoothness constraint that we build in. Um, and Hornshunk is a global approach. So for every single pixel in the image, it will uh, try and optimize for working out a U and V in the local pixel and comparing that to the, the average U and V in the, in the local area. So it's this iterative scheme, so it's pretty slow, where it goes through and tries to kind of globally find the best U and V uh, to fit the image. It looks to me like you've got to work out if something that's the same is has now moved into a different area. Is that, yeah. is that what you're kind of like yeah. looking at? It's, it is that, um, but remember that the motion that we're talking about is really tiny. So we're not talking about something that's moved forward 10 pixels. That will break optic flow. Okay. Although we could talk about how you can fix that at the end, because there's one quite neat trick uh, you can do if something's moved really fast. We're talking about tiny movements, so almost kind of sub-pixel, pixel level movements here. Um, so it's picking up changes in brightness patterns spatially but also over time as well and all the equations do is figure out a way to get these estimates of of where that little change in brightness has gone across the whole image in the case of horn chunk horn chunk's a global method it's trying to do everything across uh, the whole image so there's a load of other approaches that will calculate this um, another really common one is called the Lucas Canade um, approach to solving it. And rather than trying to say, look, let's, let's optimize this thing globally across the whole image, um, they look at a little patch. So they take a patch of pixels. So again, this looks a bit like a kernel, I guess. So it's normally sort of five by five. And you see, you're considering the pixel in the middle, but what the Lucas Canade approach says is, um, let's assume that U and V is going to be the same in all of these pixels in this region. And that gives us 25 equations, which is overdetermined, so you can use least squares to, to figure out the best fit, essentially, for U and V there. 
Um, and of course, all these things are making a huge load of assumptions, which I've already hinted uh, we have to break quite a lot. So if you've got an edge here, for example, that maybe this object is moving that way and this object is moving that way, you're going to have problems figuring out a U and V there. So some constraints might build in things that try and separate out edges um, because it, it tends to break this stuff. Um, another quite uh, interesting um, problem that you get with some of these methods is something called the aperture problem. So this is where we're trying to figure out motion. So it's called the aperture problem because we've only got a little window that we can see motion happening in like that. So the question is, which way is that line moving? So if we had to put optic flow vectors on this line, where would you say it was going? Well, I mean, the obvious thing to say is it's going down, but it could, of course, be a diagonal line moving right. It's a good answer, because it can be lots of things. If we take away that window, this is the motion that we're actually getting. So the line's just moving across the image from left to right. But it looks there that it's kind of either going diagonally down right or down. It kind of depends on how you interpret it, I guess. This is called the aperture problem or um, the barbershop pole illusion because it's got stripes moving up and down. And the idea being that there's not enough information here to, um, to accurately figure out how that, that feature is moving. It's very easy here because we can see the corners. So corners are a bit special um, and they allow us to sort of refine our estimates of motion. Um, so sometimes if we're only looking in a, um, in a small window like here, uh, we can get ambiguous motion happening that we can't uh, determine because of things like the aperture problem. So it's another sort of issue with these, these methods. The only other thing that I wanted to mention here is that, um, so Hornshunk is global. We talked about it kind of fit, finding the best set of U and Vs across the image. Um, this approach here is local, so we only care about making it work on a 5x5 patch of pixels essentially, but uh, they've got advantages and disadvantages. So one of the advantages of the global approach is if we've got an object here um, that's moving at the edges, you know, there's enough brightness changes that we can pick up movement happening. But there's a question about if this is just a sort of orange or white or whatever shape, what's happening in the middle of it. It's like the spinning ball, we can't tell. So the nice thing about a global approach is it will kind of fill in from the information it knows, it will fill in the edges throughout the shape, okay? Uh, the problem with the local approaches is if you've just got a patch here, yeah, you can kind of figure out a U and V in this location, but um, if your patch is in the middle of one of these textualist shapes, it's kind of an undetermined solution, so you might get some sort of noisy approaches. Um, so it swings and roundabouts, um, as with all, the, all of this stuff, as to whether you use a, a global approach or a, a local approach, and they've got trade-offs and speed and things like that. That's just two examples. There's loads of different ways of calculating optic flow. People are doing it with deep learning now as well, of course. Uh, um, so lots of different ways of doing it, and it's still, even though it's been around since the 80s, it's, uh, it's a very... Um, useful technique still as a way of pre-processing things, perhaps as a precursor for segmentation. So if this shape here and the background are a very similar color or texture, but this shape's moving and the background's not moving, so you've not got any flow vectors on the background, you can use the optical flow field as a way of segmenting what's going on. Okay, so uh, we've said that the motion has to be really small for any of this to work. So you need a really small time between frames. Um, again, another assumption that's going to get broken all the time is that stuff moves more than a few pixels. So if you've got an image that looks like this and you've got something here and in the next frame it moves down here, optic flow is not going to like that and it's going to break. So you're not going to get a good value out for that. There's a trick called uh, building a, an image pyramid, which certainly the Lucas Canade approach uses. So you might read about um, this approach using a pyramid scheme. And all that means is actually pretty simple. You make your image lower resolution to start with. So um, perhaps if I switch to a different color, imagine if instead of being a four by four pixel image, this is a two by two pixel image. And then whatever shape we've got here, yeah, okay, so it averages out a bit because we're sort of blurring it with our surrounding ones. But now they've become neighboring pixels and we've essentially shrunk the space over the motion that's happening. So you end up with this pyramid 
sort of system where you have low resolution, um, lower down, and then you kind of move up to higher and higher resolutions. That's a terrible image. Do you then yes. have to average out and say, okay, that one pixel is yeah, now you, the same for 20 pixels or? Exactly, so you use this as a way to kind of bootstrap the rest of it. So you calculate your motion here, so you get your motion vectors that might look like this on the low resolution one. And essentially you populate the next level up with estimates of the motion from these. So, you know, whatever was here gets filled into these four pixels. And then you do the scheme again, but because you've got a starting point this time, it will help you sort of overcome some of those bigger motions. Is this being used these days? You mentioned deep learning. What, what sort of things is it used for at the moment? Uh, yeah, it's used today. So um, I mentioned it can be used for image stabilization. So you can stabilize an image by looking at how the pixels are moving around. Um, you don't have to calculate it across the whole image. If you want to do it really quickly, you could just kind of sample bits of it. But you want to get an idea of, is the camera moving around the world in some way? And then you can sort of in software correct for that. Um, another use is uh, frame interpolation. So if you've got um, 25 frames per second video and you want to turn it into kind of fake slow-mo, if you just stretch out your frames, it will go all kind of jaggedy, right? So you get a frame and then the next frame. And because you filmed it at normal speed and you're slowing it down, it doesn't look very nice. So if you know how things are moving um, across the frame, you can add in sort of fake extra frames. So if this is your first frame and your second frame, you can add in additional frames in the middle, which you can use optic flow to kind of figure out how brightness is moving around at that point. And if you know how the sort of local patterns are moving about, you can put them in a sensible place in those interpolated frames. So rather than just pure sort of smoothing or interpolation between them, it's kind of a bit more sensible than that, a bit cleverer, and you can move surfaces sort of where they should be. So there's some quite sort of neat plugins and tricks coming around doing that kind of stuff. And one way you can do that is using optical flow. If you're trying to follow something moving very fast in an image, you know, a thing, rather than just talking about movement at the pixel level, that's going to be where you're, you're looking at object tracking, which perhaps we could do a video on in the future. For a number of reasons. If you've got a wobbly, shaky camera, you can use it for image stabilization. Hang on, hang on. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't insinuating anything. Um, yeah, so you can use optic flow to see what kind of global motion. A proper bokeh blur. I don't know how you pronounce that word. <laughs> bokeh is right. Yeah. Bokeh, right? Bokeh, bokeh. I, I, yeah.